Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining this session. In this brief talk, I want to present some ideas on how to use deep learning uh, to optimize data transmission in space missions. Um, this is a project that started as part of the Frontier Development Lab. Um, a few words on what this is in just a few seconds. And uh, this is a joint collaboration with several researchers uh, from different institutes and across the world. And uh, uh, you can see uh, all of them uh, listed in this slide. As I said, uh, this started as part of the Frontier Development Lab. Um, that is um, um, a partnership between NASA Ames and some private uh, partners uh, in the space industry and uh, in the AI industry. And what FDL does uh, each year is to um, identify some uh, problems of interest for NASA and particularly for uh, future space missions that could be uh, solved uh, with AI and to um, gather some teams of researchers uh, with different expertise and to challenge them uh, to propose some innovative solutions uh, to these problems. Um, and uh, uh, the challenge uh, that uh, my team has been asked to help with is uh, enabling uh, solar deep space missions uh, with um, quality and quantity of data that are uh, comparable uh, to what we currently have with the Solar Dynamics Observatory. And the Solar Dynamics Observatory uh, is an experiment that has been observing the sun uh, with different instruments uh, for uh, um, about more than 10 years now. And uh, what is the key information here is that um, this observatory alone is producing about uh, one terabytes of data on a daily basis. And uh, so our interest was uh, how can we use AI uh, to uh, enable uh, this vision? And um, while we focus in this project on uh, this specific experiment and some peculiarities of um, solar missions, I think this is a, a, a much more general problem that can be of interest uh, for uh, any researcher uh, working in different areas uh, for space missions. Uh, because the more we progress uh, in understanding and uh, uh, monitoring um, the sun, but also the Earth or other astronomical objects, uh, the more we are interested in uh, collecting data and uh, usually data in high resolution and with uh, um, high frequency. And uh, uh, the more data we want to collect, uh, uh, the more data uh, we want to transmit back to Earth. And, uh, um, I think it's quite common now for space missions and it will be even more in the near future uh, to produce terabytes of data on a daily basis. And uh, uh, the problem when we work with this size of data is uh, uh, not just um, the increase in cost in uh, um, transmitting this data back and uh, um, analyzing them, uh, but it's also a problem in terms of uh, time frame. Uh, how much time you will need uh, to actually uh, downstream the data back to Hurt. And uh, from a quick computation, we realized that um, for an experiment like the Solar Dynamic Observatory, if we were deep in space, uh, it will take about uh, five years uh, to transmit just one day of science um, back to Hurt. And obviously, this is simply uh, unfeasible. We need to find alternative solutions. Um, one possible uh, approach, and I think there is a, a lot of interesting research on the topic, is to um, enable um, some of the pre-processing directly on board. Uh, because um, if we allow that, um, we dramatically reduce the amount of data we need to uh, transmit to the ground. What I think it's uh, not an alternative, but rather uh, a parallel approach uh, that is what we followed, is uh, understand if there is uh, um, any pattern in the data that can be learned uh, to compress the information. And uh, because if we are in this condition, we can imagine of um, transmitting data uh, with a, an alternate source uh, framework and uh, synthetically reconstruct some of the information that we are interested in. Uh, in our case, uh, synthetically reconstructing uh, some of the images of the sun 
uh, at specific wavelengths. And uh, so this is the, um, the specific experiment uh, that, we, um, that we designed and for which we uh, tried to uh, obtain some, um, some answers. And we focus on the atmospheric imaging assembly that is one of the instruments on board of the uh, Solar Dynamics Observatory. Uh, this instrument has been observing uh, the sun in nine different uh, channels. And uh, uh, each channel is a center at a different wavelength. And uh, um, the important part here is that um, from physics, we do expect some correlation between how the sun appears in these different channels. Uh, the structure that we can see here, very small <laughs> on the sun, um, how they appear at different wavelengths, uh, it, it's, it's related. And uh, our question is, uh, can a deep learning model um, automatically learn these correlations and exploit these correlations uh, to um, synthetically produce um, some of the images? And uh, um, here we can see what is the uh, experiment design uh, that we built in order to answer this question uh, for convenience and mostly for uh, um, computational reasons, we reduce our problem to uh, four channels rather than using all the seven uh, extreme ultraviolet channels that are available. And uh, uh, we were interested in understanding can one channel completely be reproduced uh, by using other three because this will basically uh, reduce a one fourth the amount of data that we need. And uh, um, so we, we train a model to do that and we uh, compare the synthetic images uh, on the test set uh, with the original uh, images to evaluate the performance of our model. And uh, um, we use the SDO ML dataset as our starting point. That is a data, data set that is uh, um, open source available. And uh, it contains images uh, from SDO that are already uh, pre-processed and uh, are ready for machine learning purposes. And uh, we use data uh, from uh, over five years and uh, uh, splitting in training test according to the month uh, to avoid any bias due to the solar cycle. And uh, um, yeah, just to be as much general as possible. And uh, here we can see uh, what is the uh, specific architecture that we used um, for, this, um, for this experiment. That is a, um, a UNET. Um, UNET is an architecture that has been first designed for uh, medical images for segmentation. And uh, uh, the reason why we choose uh, this architecture is that it has the peculiarity to be able to learn features at very different scales. That is what we were interested in um, while maintaining the information about the locality of the features. Because in this case, uh, we're not just interested in a, a final a classification task is the feature uh, present in the image or not, but we're rather interested in reconstructing the image uh, with as much fidelity as possible. And um, I don't have the time to describe all the details, but I just want to show uh, an example of what can be obtained uh, with that kind of architecture and the amount of data that I described before. And uh, um, here on the right, we can see uh, an example of a synthetical generate image for one channel. And on the left, um, the image at the same timestamp uh, that is for real. Uh, we can see there are not differences by height. That is a, a, an encouraging first result. And uh, um, there are some differences if we uh, take the difference between the two images, that is the map that is shown uh, in the middle. And uh, um, another possible way uh, to look at this result is to um, compare uh, the real intensity with the predicted intensity uh, for each pixel. And um, in an ideal world, all the pixels should distribute on uh, um, the diagonal line. And uh, we can see in the plot on the left uh, that we are not that far from that. Uh, but obviously, uh, the system is still like uh, not able to 
perfectly uh, reproduce that line. And uh, um, for comparison on the right, uh, we show what will be the results if using um, a much simpler machine learning model uh, that is a, um, a simple linear combination of the intensity of the different uh, channels. Uh, so we can see that deep learning definitely uh, improve over um, the, the simpler machine learning approach. And, uh, um, but we can also observe um, if we focus on the color um, that we do have some areas of struggle. And here the color map represent um, the density of the pixel of the, of the values in the data set. Uh, and um, blue here stands for pixels that are uh, very high energetic and extremely rare. And uh, um, so we see that in that case, uh, the deep learning model uh, struggle in currently reproducing the results. Um, we should not be too surprised about this uh, because these are rare events. Uh, this means that we're working on an imbalanced data set. And uh, um, this is exactly one of the biggest challenges that we um, encounter working on this project. Um, we're interested uh, ideally in reproducing all the possible events uh, that happened in the past and that can possibly happen in the future if we want to synthetically reproduce something. Uh, but if we have few examples, uh, a deep learning model will always struggle uh, to uh, accurately uh, reproduce those. And uh, uh, the other challenge um, is that, um, and this is very peculiar to science, we work with a, um, a very high range uh, of values for the intensity of the pixels. Uh, those values span um, several orders of magnitude. And uh, uh, this high range of variability um, is not something common uh, for deep learning. Um, architectures are usually designed uh, to work with data uh, with a much smaller uh, span of magnitude uh, in the values of the, uh, of the data. I think that my time is running out. I would like just to uh, conclude um, summarizing what we have seen and uh, uh, some key ideas. Um, so first of all, we have seen that an image to image translation approach could be a promising method to reduce data transmission needs in future solar missions. Uh, which are the full limitations of this approach are still to be determined and this is work in progress. Uh, interestingly, uh, the same approach uh, could be used to compress signal also uh, in other space missions um, in completely different fields. Uh, I'm thinking, for example, to hurt observation. Everywhere, basically, there is a, a repeatable pattern uh, between multi-wavelength images. A similar approach could be tried uh, to, um, to compress the signal. And uh, uh, finally, uh, we have seen some of the um, challenges of, um, of this approach. Um, and, uh, um, but there are some other AI approaches that could be used in combination with this to try to solve this problem. Uh, for example, uh, we could think of uh, using also some attention filter uh, that learn to revert to full data transmission uh, just for specific areas of the images or at specific time uh, when we know that the uncertainty of the model uh, is, uh, is too high uh, for us to be able uh, to synthetically reproduce our um, science output. And uh, this is it for me. Uh, thank you very much for your attention.